بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله النبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد brothers and sisters what we're going to do إن شاء الله um, I thought rather than just cover the odd topic here and the odd topic there I thought I'd go through in a little bit of detail Tawheed and also Shirk and so every time that I come, inshallah, I'll bring a different perspective on Tawheed, what are the categories of Tawheed, how did the science of Tawheed develop, was it something that the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is it something that they developed, is it something that developed after them, why did the scholars develop this science of Tawheed and the other sciences that we have, fiqh, hadith, etc. Why were these sciences developed? We'll also then look at shirk insha'Allah. We'll also then look in more detail at those things which nullify a person's deen from within this Tawheed perspective. Not in a great de amount of detail because we don't have a lot of time. But insha'Allah we'll, we'll do as best as we can insha'Allah. Okay, firstly, Ikhwani, the word Aqeedah, when we are talking about anything in this religion, we need to define our terms. The word Aqeedah, it comes from the root word aqd. And what this means is something which is firmly tied. Something which is closed and something which is firmly tied. And the plural of this word is aqaid. So if you're talking about a set of beliefs within Islam, we say it's aqaid. Or if we say to somebody, you know, what is the aqidah of Islam? What are the beliefs? What is the aqaid? So linguistically, ikhwani, it means that there's a principle or a belief that there is no doubt about it. The one who believes it, he does not hold any, any doubts in his mind. It's a closed subject. When we are talking in terms of the Sharia, then it refers to those beliefs that a person must hold. There's a, a set of beliefs that a person must hold and he has to feel sure of them in his heart and he should be content with them. And this, Ikhwani, it entails six things. First thing that it entails is belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It also entails belief in the angels, belief in the books which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, belief in the messengers, belief in the last day, yawm al-qiyamah, al-yawm al-akhir, and belief in qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. One of the terms that we're always going to be using is salaf. And many of you brothers and sisters, or some of you brothers and sisters, might not, might not actually know what this term salaf means. Okay, salaf, it comes from the verb Salafa, which means to go before, something which has gone before. And in terms of Aqeedah, what we are referring to Ikhwani is we are referring to those people who have gone before the first three generations of the Muslims and those who have followed in their footsteps. Why? Because these are those people who they understood the religion better than anybody else and the companions radiallahu anhum ajma'een they took the religion directly from the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam they were there when the Quran was being revealed so of course they have the best understanding because they have the best teacher so they are our salaf they are the salaf those who have come before so we, we seek to tread the path of the salaf and when you go on this path it's called Salafiyyah. You've probably heard many times this word Salafiyyah. Is it a group? Is it a sect? Is it one of the 73 sects which are, which are going to come from amongst the Muslims? Ikhwani, no. It's necessary today to define yourself as a Salafi or upon the Dawah of the Salaf simply because what you're saying, I take my understanding of this religion from those pious predecessors, the way the companions understood it, from the way their teach it, from the way their students understood it, from the way their students understood it. So I'm taking my religion as was understood by the best and most pious of generations. And Ikhwani, this is the only path, this is the only path that we can take. And as I said, Aqeedah, the word Aqd means something which is firmly tied. So Ikhwani, in terms of uh, you know, aqidah, there's no real room for difference of opinion. No, these, these things are uh, opinions or these things are firmly tied. These are beliefs which are firmly tied. Every single Muslim has to believe in them. 
And if you take a different route, Ikhwani, you're actually upon misguidance. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, and whoever opposes the messenger after guidance has become clear to him, and he follows a way other than the way of the believers, we will give him what he has taken and drive him into hell, and what an evil destination it is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite clearly mentioning that if you oppose the messenger and the way of the believers. Ikhwani, the way of the believers here in this ayah is the companions of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Elsewhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how pleased he is with the, uh, with the companions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِالْإِبِئِ بإحسان بإحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه وعد لهم جنة تجري من تحت تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا ذلك الفوز العظيم. Allah subhanahu wa taala says and the foreigners and the first from amongst the muhajirin and the ansar and those who follow them and those who follow them with good conduct. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him and he has prepared for them gardens underneath which rivers flow where they will abide forever. That is the great success. So Ikhwani, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions quite clearly here. Allah is pleased with the companions from amongst the muhajireen and the ansar and anybody who follows their way. Anybody who follows their way. So when we are talking about Tawheed and the Aqeedah, we have to look at it from the perspective of the companions. Is this how they understood this ayah? Is this how they understood this hadith? And if we can't find anything from amongst the companions, from the Prophet wasallam, from the Quran, then we have to know that what we are upon is actually misguidance. Because this is not the way of the companions of the Prophet wasallam. Ikhwani, we have today, before we go into this aqeedah, we have today people who are mocking the companions, they belittle the companions. What these people don't actually understand is when you are doing this, you are actually mocking the Qur'an itself. How was the Qur'an transmitted to us today? It was transmitted through the companions, radiallahu anhum. How was the sunnah transmitted? It was transmitted through the companions, radiallahu anhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how pleased he is with those companions. So by mocking them and belittling them, you are actually mocking the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so to proceed, ikhwani, what does this word tawheed mean? What does this word tawheed mean? This word tawheed, literally it means unification or to make something one. To make something one. Linguistically, it means to make something one. And it comes from the root word, wahada. And this means to consolidate, to make something one. Of course, when we are talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal is already one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already one. What it means in the terms of the sharia, it means that we firstly recognize and then we maintain the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of his rububiyah, his lordship, his asma wa sifat and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we recognize it and we maintain it in everything that we do. And Ikhwani, this is the only thing that is going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ عَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ The day on which wealth and children are not going to benefit you except for the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. Ikhwani, a sound heart here means that you are, it's a heart free from shirk. It's a heart free from innovation. It's a heart free from kufr and disbelief. This is the only thing, Ikhwani, that is going to benefit us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So going forward from here, inshaAllah, what are we going to do over the coming weeks? Today is not, you know, nowhere near enough time to even cover or scratch the surface of how Tawheed or the science of Tawheed developed. But we're going to do our best, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So we're going to look why was it necessary, Ikhwani? Why do we need to say Tawheed? Why is Tawheed broken down into three parts? Does that mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in three parts? What does this actually mean? Why are we breaking Tawheed down? Did the companions break it down this way? So Ikhwani, the first thing that we need to mention is that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they never broke down Tawheed into three parts. Because of their level of understanding, because of the way that they were taught, because of their teacher, 
because of the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened their hearts. They understood Tawheed as a whole and there was no need for them to break it down into various categories or to break it down into various uh, other you know, subcategories. So when we say that Tawheed is broken into three categories, Ikhwani, this is only to make us able to understand it easier to make us to, uh, un understand it better. This doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is three. We don't, we don't believe in the Trinity or anything remotely like that. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. But when we are studying Tawheed, we try and break it down into different parts so that we can understand it better with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, Ikhwani, if somebody was to say to you, prove to me from the Qur'an, Prove to me from the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Prove to me from the Qur'an. You know, we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Prove to me from the Qur'an. What is Tawheed? What is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So I'm going to mention some ayat insha'Allah. Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, in the 54th ayah, أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرُ تَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, unquestionably, His is the creation, His is the command. Blessed is Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Blessed is Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So from here, Ikhwani, quite clearly we can see that the creation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, His is the creation and His is the command. Ikhwani, elsewhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكُمُ اللَّهُ رَبُّكُمْ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ فَأَنَّا تُؤْفَكُونَ That is Allah, your Lord, the creator of all things. There is nothing worthy of worship except for Him. So how are you deluded? This is in Surah, uh, surah Ghafir. Elsewhere in Surah Al-Hashr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى He is Allah, the creator, the inventor, the fashioner. To him belong all of the most beautiful names. Elsewhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya, Had there been within the heavens and the earth gods besides Allah, they would have been ruined. So exalted is Allah, the Lord of the earth. Lord of the throne above what they ascribe to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ikhwani, now quickly, briefly, not much time left. We said at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, Tawheed was understood and it did not need to be divided or taught in any way except through the direct teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Ikhwani, after the death of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam, Islam began, the Islam, the religion, it began to spread far and wide very, very quickly. Very quickly, new lands were being brought into the Muslim empire by the, and they were be, uh, coming into Islam. And they were learning the religion directly from the companions. So for example, the Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he would send his companions, the companions, he would send them to different parts of the Muslim world and say, go and live there, govern that area and teach the people their religion. So the people, they were learning Islam directly from the companions. So there was no need, again, to divide Tawheed up into various categories. After this, Ikhwani, the companions, many of them died, but the scholars, they had a very close relationship with the Muslim ruler at the time. So anybody who had these deviant ideas, people who were coming in from Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and they were bringing these, uh, you know, these weird and wonderful beliefs and trying to implement them into the Muslim pure beliefs, monotheistic beliefs, the person was either, to either told, recant, take back your beliefs, or that person was actually killed. So these false beliefs, they never had the chance to spread. And at this time, this was the time of companions like Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an. Younger companions, younger companions, they were now growing older. And this though, alhamdulillah, there was a close link between the scholars and the rulers. So the pure teachings of Islam were preserved. Ikhwani, the first deviation in Tawheed, it came from a Christian revert. So this man, his lands came into uh, under Muslim rule, he accepted Islam. His name was Sosin. His name was Sosin. And this man, he went astray in Qadr. 
He was one of the Qadariya. This is how the Qadariya movement started. He went astray in Qadr. And he would express his ideas in debates. So he would spread these false beliefs, you know. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know what we are doing? Are our actions created? Do we do things and Allah is unaware of them? Therefore, can we be held to account, etc. These deviated ideas, he would begin to express them in his debates. Ikhwani, subhanallah, a lesson to be learned here. When you don't have good foundations in the deen, you're going to collapse. And this man, Sosin, he actually left the religion. He actually left the religion, but he infected his main student. And his name was Ma'bad ibn Khalid al-Juhani. And this, Ikhwani, was the main student of Sosin. And Ma'bad, he spread this falsehood. And he was executed in the year 700 Christian era. So 700 CE, according to the Christian calendar, 700 years. At the, and this was about 40 years after Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. So after the death of Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, this man was executed because he was spreading these false beliefs. And he was executed by the Caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Ikhwani, we need to notice at the moment there's a strong bond between the scholars and the rulers. But Ikhwani, Ma'bad students. So Sosin is the main man. He started this. He infected Ma'bad ibn Khalid al-Juhani. And then Ma'bad was executed. But his students, Ikhwani, they began and they continued to spread this falsehood. Ikhwani, as time passed, in the later Umayyad uh, caliphate, the rulers of the time, they began to stray far away from the scholars. They began to stray far away from Islam. So into their courts, they would have these courts, and into their courts, they began to introduce dancing girls. They began to introduce music. They began to introduce alcohol. And astrology was also introduced into their courts. And because of this, Ikhwani, the scholars of Islam, they began to distance themselves from the rulers. So now notice we have a divide coming where the scholars are no longer connected to the rulers because of the haram that is being propagated. So Ikhwani, this continued and the rulers were too busy filling their pockets with wealth with women, with chasing the alcohol, etc, etc. So the concern for the deen, it decreased. And these people who were spreading false ideas, they were no longer being executed or being told to recant for their falsehood. So Ikhwani, this falsehood is started with Qadr, with the predestination. But then subhanAllah, it got to the level and it started to spread to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's asma wa sifat, Allah's names and attributes, to the point where ikhwani, they got so deviated that what they said was, look, man exists. Therefore, if we say that Allah exists, we have compared man to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they went as far as saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot exist. So they've actually, this one idea which was false, it led them to disbelief. It took them out of the religion of, of Islam. So the scholars at this time, Ikhwani, this is why they developed the sciences of Tawheed. This is why they developed the sciences of Hadith, the sciences of Fiqh, the science of Aqidah, etc. To protect the pure teachings of Islam from these false innovations. Because the leaders at the time, 40, 50, 60 years after Ali radiallahu an, now they are only bothered and only concerned about women, etc., wealth, and they are no longer concerned about preserving the pure teachings of Islam. So the scholars have to develop this science of aqidah, of, of uh, fiqh, of hadith, etc., because people are now beginning to innovate inside the religion. Does everybody understand this? So if somebody was to say to you, did the companions break Tawheed down into parts or study Tawheed the way we are studying it? The fact is, no, because there was no need. But the scholars who were from amongst the later generation, they had to do this to protect the Aqidah of Islam. Finally, Ikhwani, we're just going to look at the three categories of Tawheed. Just mention them. And then in following lessons, inshallah, what we're going to do is look at them in a bit more detail, look at their proof from the Qur'an, from the Sunnah, and look at how we can integrate them into our daily lives. The first category, ikhwani, is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. 
Tawheed al rububiya This means the oneness of lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this means that we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one without any partner. He has no wife, he has no son. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alone without any partner. He is alone and unique with regards to his actions such as creation. Allah is the only one who can create. Allah is the only one who has complete control over the over the universe. Allah is the one who owns everything in the universe. In the heavens and the earth, everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls the disposition of the affairs. Allah is the one who decides what's going to happen. This is Tawheed al rububiyyah So basically we recognize Allah is one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one without any partners. Allah is the creator. Allah is the sustainer. Allah is the disposer of the affairs of all of the creation. The next category, Ikhwani, is Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat. The oneness of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This means that we affirm the names and attributes of Allah and we believe that there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing like Allah in his names and his attributes. Again, we will go through this in more detail insha'Allah. And the third is Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. The oneness or Tawheed al-Ibadah. The oneness of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means because Allah is one, because Allah is our creator, our sustainer, because there is nothing like Allah in his names and attributes, he is the only one that deserves to be worshipped and he deserves to be worshipped alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it means we dedicate all of our acts of worship in our words, in the things that we say, in the things that we feel in our heart, and in our actions. We do all of this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And finally, I have to emphasize a very important point. People who have a disease in, this, in their hearts, they say, you know, you people who claim to be following the path of the salaf, of those who came before you, you break Tawheed down into three parts. You break down the oneness of Allah into three parts. You have like, the, you, this is the same as the Trinity. Ikhwani, very important. We do not say Allah is one of three. We say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. But to study and to understand his oneness, we break it down into three parts to make it easier for us to understand. And this was the way of the scholars of the past and they actually did this. So Ikhwani, next time, inshallah, whenever we meet, it's been a very short session today. Next time, inshallah, we are going to look in more detail at Tawheed al rububiyyah The oneness of the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to combat somebody who says, you know, Allah says in the Quran, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Blessed is Allah, the best of creators. So Allah says in the Quran that there's more than one creator. In Sahih Bukhari, there's a hadith which is narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, in which the Messenger of Allah says, Allah will say on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, give life to that which you have created. So in the Quran and in the Sunnah, there seemingly is a contradiction. Allah is saying there's other creators. The Messenger of Allah is telling us in his hadith there's other creators. How to refute these people when they bring these false arguments. How to, what ayahs are there in the Qur'an which mention the oneness of Allah and prove that he is alone in his creation, in his ownership and his disposition of affairs. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a beneficial series and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who we have a qalbun salim, a pure heart which is free from any shirk and innovation and deviation. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who we are treading the path of the Salaf al Salih, those righteous predecessors. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.